We will now proceed under the five-minute rule with questions. I will recognize myself for five minutes. According to documents we've received from the Bureau, the FBI was aware that several violent extremists already under investigation were preparing to travel to Washington in January. In December, FBI Atlanta issued an alert that certain militia groups were preparing for a significant event in January, perhaps on Inauguration Day. And on January 5th, a report from FBI Norfolk warned about specific calls for violence at the Capitol the next day, some of them graphic. Congress needs to hear of glass breaking, doors being kicked in, and blood being spilled. The report also noted that individuals were sharing maps of the tunnels underneath the Capitol complex and listed rally points where the attackers would gather before advancing on the building. We know that the Norfolk report made it to the FBI's Washington field office in advance of the attack. And yet, for days after the attack, the head of that field office insisted that it, that it had received no intelligence suggesting anything other than First Amendment activity. Director A, the warnings coming in from around the country were clear. Here in Washington, the, did the FBI simply miss the evidence, or did it see the evidence and fail to piece it together? Well, Mr. Chairman, uh, as you could imagine, we are just as outraged by what happened on January 6th and just as determined to do our part to make sure that never happens again. Now, the Norfolk report that you referenced uh, was a specific piece of raw, unverified intelligence that emerged on January 5th, the day before, from a source online, unvetted, uh, and despite the raw nature of it, it was quickly passed, not one, not two, but three different ways to the Capitol Police. One, an email to uh, their representatives on our Joint Terrorism Task Force, uh, two, in a verbal briefing in our command post that included members of the Capitol Police, MPD, et cetera. And third, uh, in our law enforcement portal, which all law enforcement uh, partners have access to. Uh, so we tried to uh, make sure that we got that information to the right people. Obviously, anytime there is an attack, especially one as significant as this one, uh, you can be darn sure that we are going to be looking hard at how we can do better, how we can do more, how we can do things differently in terms of collecting, analyzing, and disseminating intelligence. Now, you also mentioned uh, individuals under investigation uh, before January 6th. So a couple things on that. First, uh, the FBI did disseminate, uh, I think, about a dozen intelligence products, including warning of domestic violent extremism related to the election, some talking about it continuing past the election all the way through inauguration, uh, including reports together with DHS put out in December uh, the month before. As far as individuals actually under investigation, now that we're close to 500 arrests into the matter, um, you may be surprised to, to learn that, in fact, almost none of the individuals charged and found to be involved with uh, the attack on the Capitol were, in fact, individuals who were previously present. Okay, at, 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 at 12.53 p.m. on January 6th, rioters broke through the outer barricades surrounding the lawn of the Capitol. Shortly after 1.45, the rioters surged past the Capitol police protecting the Capitol's west steps, and at 1.49, officers officially declared there was a riot at the Capitol. Acting Attorney General Rosen testified before the Oversight Committee that he learned that the FBI and the ATF received requests for assistance from the Capitol Police and were be beginning to respond. When specifically in that timeline of events did Capitol Police request assistance from the FBI, and how quickly was that help deployed? I don't have the specific time for you, so I don't want to misspeak. Okay. Um, okay. The FBI's Washington field office is one of the largest field offices in the country. The field office was reportedly found, found in, by an internal review in 2019 to be both ineffective and inefficient. Specifically, the review criticized the field office's mechanisms for collecting and analyzing threat intelligence, as well as its procedures for sharing intelligence with other law enforcement agencies, including the Capitol Police. Did the Washington field office's uh, domestic terrorism shortcomings lead to a delayed response in the lead up to and on January 6th? Uh, my recollection of that particular audit or, or inspection um, is that it was a while back and that we had recently changed the leadership of the Washington Field Office and made a number of reforms. So to my knowledge, at least, 
none of the issues that were discussed in that earlier report contributed to the response on January 6. Thank you. My time is short, but I want to get in one last question. In February, the Secretary of Defense converted senior military officials and civilian leadership of the armed forces to assess the problem of extremist ideology in the military's ranks. In late April, the Department of Homeland Security announced it was conducting an internal review to root out white supremacy and other extremist ideology in its ranks. There can be no question that law enforcement agencies across the country face a similar challenge. Is the FBI conducting its own internal inspection or review to root out white supremacy and other extremist ideology? And if not, will you commit to conducting such a review? Well, Mr. Chairman, obviously we take the, the prospect of what uh, the intelligence community or law enforcement would refer to as an insider threat uh, very seriously. We have a whole slew of procedures and internal reviews that speak to that. Uh, and I'd be happy to see if we can provide you more information on that uh, separately. Thank you very much. My time has expired. Christopher Ray was uh, fr flat out lying right there. And the, and the fact is, uh, he is an incompetent director. He was not qualified for this job. I think I'm you know, a huge Trump supporter, but I think it was one of the biggest mistakes uh, of the Trump presidency was putting Christopher Ray in there. And uh, I think he showed it, especially in this, his opening remarks that he made today, how biased he actually is. Because everything that he said, especially about extremist violence, was completely sided to the left. Everything that had to do with any type of group that calls themselves patriots or anything that happened on January 6th was noted and, and displayed by his language as something that is far extreme with very little, if any, people that were there that, to be peaceful. And he made it sound as though the left is mostly peaceful with just a few things. Everything that comes out of this guy's mouth is pushed to the left, but it's subtle. So if you've been you know, a prosecutor or a, a U.S. attorney, or if you've been in the FBI and you listen to his language, you can literally see this. And I, I, I think some of these congressmen and congresswomen actually saw this today, and I think they went after him, but he's not going to bend as far as that goes. I will tell you that I have spoken directly to FBI agents that are investigating January 6th, you know, um, issues, and ranging from individuals that uh, were in the Capitol to individuals who were not in the Capitol. One, one thing that stands out, the, the, the most recent conversation I had with an FBI, FBI agent here in Salt Lake indicated he said he's never seen anything like this. They are given a mandate. They are to go out. They have been given the questions they're supposed to be asking. They have been given the way they're supposed to proceed on this case. They don't have individualized authority. It is all coming from Washington, D.C. I've spoken to prosecutors that are prosecuting these cases. And this is not individualized justice. They are lumping everybody into the same category and they are treating them uh, like, un unlike I've ever seen in a case. Uh, the Department of Justice is supposed to address every single case, unless it's a conspiracy case, according to the criminal conduct of that individual. They're not doing that. None of the prosecutors mm -hmm. have authority. It's all coming straight from Washington, D.C. There is so much energy put towards these people, and there's not the same energy put towards Antifa. Why didn't he explain that? Why couldn't he explain that? Well, I don't think he could explain it because, again, he was making this into uh, more of a political uh, stand. And, you know, he, he said there were three categories of people on January 6th. He failed to completely mention the people who were literally invited into uh, the Capitol building by the, the Capitol Police. And the majority of the people that were there did nothing. It, he made it sound as though if you came on the Capitol grounds, you were an extremist. And that is just not the case. There were some violent people there. There were some people that went into the Capitol that did some very nefarious things. But his category, uh, the way he categorized these people was absolutely wrong. And the way that the FBI has systematically as uh, Brett just uh, pointed out there, been told how to investigate January 6th, they've systematically been kept from truly investigating or going after the leftists. And that is so clear because of the way that there's just nothing going down about these individuals on the left. And I'll, I'll just say one other thing. In all my time in the FBI, the only white supremacist case that I ever saw, and I was in New York the entire time, was prison-related. There was no white supremacy, uh, massive 
uh, agenda going on in the United States, and it's not happening now. And it's another example of how they use these things and push them out in the media. When you think about what Antifa did last summer, the number of federal properties that they destroyed um, or defaced, and the money that they caused to small businesses, the, the, the police officers who they injured, the Secret Service members, they really haven't been held accountable to the same type of behavior that they did all last summer. Why not? They have not been. I mean, you think about what domestic terrorism is. When you burn down a police station and you take over city blocks, that's domestic terrorism. And they have not been held accountable. Uh, I'm ashamed to, to say that, you know, my, my former office, you know, the Department of Justice, I, I wish I could see courage. I wish I, I could see U.S. attorneys standing up. You know, it's interesting. I, I represent an individual who... Um, went into the Capitol, um, was told she could go in and was actually pointed by a security guard to the direction she should go. And she's being prosecuted. She's being charged with uh, misdemeanors. She, she has no criminal history. She thought the only other Capitol she's ever been in is a state Capitol that's open 24 seven. She thought you could walk in. She, so there's a, there's a wide disparity a, a, between, you know, who Chris Ray is identifying and they want to prosecute every single person that was there to send a message. And that's what this is. It's message prosecuting. And, and, and that's mm -hmm. never a, a, an appropriate decision by a prosecutor.